And everybody online, so great to have all of you with us this morning. So glad we can worship together like this. Well, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. April 11th, 1970. Some of you remember it well, and some of you were not on the planet like myself. We launched our third planned mission to land on the moon, uh, the Apollo 13 mission. And it went off without a hitch, and things were going great on their three-day journey to the moon until we got to the end of the second day. And that's when one of the oxygen tanks exploded and wreaked havoc on the spacecraft. In that moment, they, they decided to abandon the planned mission to get to the moon. We need to redirect new mission, survive. We need to get back to the earth. And so they changed all of their efforts just to try to get home. On their approach to earth, they realized that they were coming into the atmosphere at the wrong angle, which meant they would burn up once they hit the earth's atmosphere. They needed to change the angle of re-entry, but, but to navigate that in their spacecraft, they needed a fixed point of reference to navigate. And well, they looked out the window and they found one where they were headed. The earth was right there, and they were able to line the earth up with the, uh, looking through the window. And if they could hold the view of the earth through the window, a fixed point in space, they then could navigate. And they burned their engines for 39 seconds exactly. And they changed their course. They corrected their course and were able to make it through the atmosphere of the earth without burning up. And they splashed down and the story ends happily ever after. Uh, you and I are similar to the astronauts of the Apollo 13 mission. We, too, can easily get off course and need a course correction. Uh, it's, it's easy for us to find ourselves with our priorities misaligned as we go through life. It's easy for us to find our compassion missing towards that person or those people. It's easy to find our words without kindness in them. It's easy to find ourselves without God as the center point of our daily living. It's easy for us to get off course. And much like those astronauts on the Apollo 13 trip, they needed a fixed point of reference in order to course correct. We need a fixed point. And what we're going to discover today as we conclude our series that we've been in, Words of Life, that fixed point that you and I and everybody needs in order to course correct is the Word of God. So we're going to see today, uh, as we look again into Psalm 119, Psalms uh, in the Old Testament, it's the longest Psalm in the Old Testament, and it is a powerful Psalm written all about the Word of God. And as we've looked at that over the, the past many weeks of this series, we've seen that God uses His Word to impart life to you and I in different ways. And what we're going to see today is that He imparts life to us by providing us with life-giving correction. We see it in the uh, 35th, 36th, and 37th verse. Let's take a look at these three verses that we're going to be uh, pulling apart and understanding together this morning. It says this, Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. This is the psalmist asking God for a course correction. I need a course correction because I want to live according to your word and find the life that is only found in living according to your way. In, in, in 2019, the Grand Canyon saw a season of great tragedy. There were three people that fell to their death within eight weeks, which is unheard of, uh, to have that many in that short amount of time. And so the Grand Canyon National Park Service uh, tried to figure out, what are we going to do about this? People are, are just not thinking right about traveling through the Grand Canyon. So they put out this 
bulletin, and it said, have a safe visit, and here's how, by staying on designated trails and walkways, always keeping a safe distance from the edge of the rim and staying behind railings and fences at overlooks. Short version, stay on the path. Please stay on the path. Venturing from the path is dangerous. Staying on the path leads to staying alive. I remember I got to go to the Grand Canyon uh, many, many, many years ago uh, with my, my youth group. Uh, we, were, we were doing a choir tour. My parents were on the trip, and we were looking over the edge of the Grand Canyon, and, and I have pictures of some of us hanging upside down on the railings right next to the cliff, having a great time. We thought it was fun. My parents were freaking out, but uh, we had a great time. And, and what we see is, is that there is this desire to move as close to the edge as we can. We're going to talk about that more in a little bit, but we need to understand that, that what the, they did in the park at that time, because people were doing that and falling to their deaths, they're trying to help people understand to stay on the path is where staying alive takes place. And God has a path like they have in the Grand Canyon to stay on that provides life for us. In Psalm 16, take a look what it says here in verse 11. You, this psalmist praying, talking to God, you make known to me the what, everybody? Path of life. One more time, the path of life. Okay, so, so there's a path of life that God has for us. Not just a path, but a path of of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is in the business of giving life. He wants to impart life to us, and he says that life is found on his path. Oh, if we could just get our hands around this. If we could just really grab a hold of this reality that life is found in God's path. The unfortunate truth is that you and I are really, really good at wandering off the path of going to the railing, climbing over the railing, hanging from the rail. We love to leave the path. And, and so here's the first thing I want you to see in this is that we are prone to wander from God's path. We're prone to do this. This was true of the psalmist. Look at his prayer in that first verse we just read, in verse 35. He says, lead me in the path of your commandments. Lead me in your truth, your word. And those two words at the beginning, lead me, can also be translated from the original language, make me. So he's not just saying, you go ahead and I'll follow if I feel like it. He's saying, listen, make me go in your path. Grab a hold of me and pull me in the path that I need to go. There's an admission in this. And the admission, this humble admission is, I'm not going to go the way I should go without your help. I can't do this. I need you to grab me and pull me in the right direction. It reminds me, as I was reading this, of my dog. When I take my dog on a walk, she just goes right down the middle of the road and doesn't look sideways and just... No, that's complete fabrication. She goes everywhere. She does not go this direction. She goes this direction. She's got to smell and sniff every mailbox, go in everybody's yard. And I am constantly pulling this dog away from something. It is quite a workout to go just a little distance walking my dog. And, and the psalmist is saying, I, I am just like this. I, I, I want to run off to the sides and, and I want to go off the right path. I, I want to leave the way I should be and go sniff mailboxes. That's what I want to do. I just, I, I'm prone to running into everybody else's yard. And he's saying, but I know I need to be on the path. So God, yank me, grab my leash and pull me, make me get back on your path. Backpacking a, a few years ago with my son, we had gone to Dolly Sod's uh, over in the eastern part of our state. And uh, we got out of the car and we put on our packs. And right as we were starting to go on the trail, downpour, just torrential downpour. So we put on our ponchos and we're hiking and, and we're following the trail. And then the trail got a little smaller and a little smaller. And well, then the trail disappeared. Uh, we had inadvertently gotten off of the path. 
we were actually following a deer trail, didn't realize that we had left the actual trail. Uh, and, and we found ourselves in the wilderness, really deep into the wilderness, with thick underbrush all around us, trying to push through everything. And, and we, what we think is this, you know, if we will leave the trail, that's where the adventure is. That's where the fun is. That's where the sparkle of life is found. Let's get off the trail. Can I just tell you that getting off of that trail was adventurous, but it was not fun and there was no sparkle. Uh, I was carrying most of the weight because my son at the time was, was much smaller. And so we're going through dense underbrush and swinging under trees and carrying, and it was arduous. It was tiresome and it got to be painful. And I was getting to the point where I was losing it. Like, we got to get out of this and find where we're going. We had no idea where we were, how to get out of there. And so I began praying. I said, God, please show me the path. Get me to the path. Where is the path? And not long after that is God is really good at, as we ask him for things, God wants to direct us. He wants to bless us. Just ask. So I, I asked, and, and there was this little steep hill that kind of went up on one side in this thick underbrush. I said, I'm going to climb up there and just see what's over the hill. And so I pulled some trees, and I kind of got up, and as soon as I got to the top, I crested it and went, well, what do you know? There's the path. And oh, the relief we found. I went back down. It's there. We found the trail. We found the trail. We found the path. Oh, this is great. And we celebrated, and we got back up, and now we knew where we were. We knew how to get where we were going. The pain and the suffering, all of it was over, and we could just go where we needed to go. Our despair off the path turned to delight when we got back on the path. We're, we're prone to wander from God's path, but we need to come back because it's where delight and life is found in your life. Look what it says in verse 35 and 37 that we looked at. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I what? Everybody? Delight in it. And then at the end of verse 37, it said, and give me what? Life. In your ways, on your path, the, the, the way that we find the delight and the life that we're looking for is by getting on God's path. So the second thing I want you to see is that the, God's path is the path to delight and life. And that, that, that is contrary to what many assume. And quite honestly, all of us have a little bit inside of us that really believe that, that God's path is a downgrade. It's probably the right thing to do, but the good stuff is off his path. And so we live, I know I should be here. This is good, this is right, this is probably what God likes. However, that looks really better and more fun and more satisfying. So we get to the edge of the path and we lean over trying to grab everything we can, being as good as we can, but getting as much as we can over here. We think that's how we're going to get the best out of life. But the, the, the truth is this, that if it's off God's path, it's actually more like junk food. Junk food tastes great right away. Man, it's wonderful. Any, any junk food fans? Let's just be honest, all right? I, both hands. Like, I love it because it's good. It's delicious. But here's the thing. Does it do anything good for you? No. Uh, it, it does not bring more vitality to your life. It actually removes vitality from your life. Although it tastes good in the first taste, it doesn't actually help you. What we need to understand is that there is nothing, and please, please hear this, there is nothing off of God's path that breathes life into you. If you step off of God's path thinking this will be better, it might taste good, but it will not breathe life into you. It will remove it. It will remove it. Why? Because... There's only one way that God made you and I to live, and that's according to his design. God didn't say, okay, there, there's all kinds of stuff you can do, and I'm just going to take some of the good stuff and tell you don't do it and just do this. And that's kind of the concept that, that many of us carry with us. Well, I probably should do God's stuff because he said so, but there's all this other good stuff, and I guess I have to stay away from that and just do the good. God said, listen, I made you to experience delight and life full of life. And you know where you find that? Right here. This is the way. Go this way. Come on. Get on the right path. And we're going, ah, I don't know. It looks pretty good over here. It's going, please, just get on the path. Come on. 
Because we're made and designed to live life full of life on God's path. And so if God's path is the path of delight and life that is really breathing life into us, the question is this, why would you and I ever leave it? If that's true, why would we ever go any other direction? In verse 36, the psalmist gives us insight. He says, incline my, I didn't highlight it, but what's that third word? My heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. You see, he's praying and he's asking God, help me with my heart. Why? Because the heart of the issue is an issue of our hearts. That's the issue. That's, that's what we're dealing with here. The reason we would leave God's path is because of our hearts. Our hearts are inclined in the wrong direction. He's saying, incline my heart to the right direction because it is misguided right here and right now. See, our hearts desire to leave God's path. Our hearts want to get off of whatever God's path is. Our hearts, the reason for it is because they're corrupted by sin. The desires of our sinful nature are always contrary to God's. In the New Testament of the Bible, there's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. It's called Galatians. In the fifth chapter, look what he says. Uh, for the desires of the flesh, and by, by that, he's not talking about skin. He's talking about our sinful nature, our corrupted hearts. And he says, for the desires of that sinful nature, our flesh, are against the Spirit of God. The desires of the Spirit of God and here's our sinful desires. They're not the same. They're always at odds. He says, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. I, I want to do this. I want to stay on God's path. But why do I find myself over here? Because my heart is deceived. My heart is corrupt. And it wants anything but God's way. So we have this errant desire living inside of us that keeps taking us off God's path. To overcome this misguided desire, we need more than simply our strength or willpower. Pastor Rick Warren has a great analogy. I want to share it with you. He, he, he uses the analogy of a speedboat. He says, imagine riding in a speedboat on a lake with an automatic pilot set to go east. If you decide to reverse and head west, you have a couple ways that you can change the boat's direction. One way is this, to grab the steering wheel and physically force it to head in the opposite direction from where the autopilot is programmed to go. By sheer willpower, you could overcome the autopilot, but you would feel constant resistance. Your arms would eventually tire from the stress. You'd let go of the steering wheel and the boat would instantly head back east the way it was internally programmed. And that is a great picture of you and I. If we are off course and our heart is longing for something off of God's path, to grab it and go, I'm going to get back on, I'm going to do it God's way, you can grab the wheel and turn it. But the moment you forget to hold the wheel steady or your arms get tired, snap, you're gone again. Because sinful desire is opposed to the ways of God. You've got this autopilot going on inside us. And our willpower is not enough to course correct. It just is not enough to do that. If you decide now, by tomorrow, you will have gone back the other way. The psalmist knows this, and so he doesn't say, I'm going to try really hard to turn the wheel, God. He asks God to turn the wheel for him to do and to want what God wants. Verse 36, incline my heart to your testimonies. Turn my heart, God. I can't do it. And, and turn it this way and not to selfish gain. This is the direction my heart is focused on myself, getting for me. It's all about me. And he admits that what he is desiring over here is empty. I know it's empty. Verse 37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. I know these are worthless, but my eyes keep going to it and desiring it. The reason that you and I end up pursuing things off of God's path is because we believe that there's more satisfaction in what we want than in what God wants for us. I really believe it'll be better. 
My life will be better, more satisfying, and more fulfilling if I get what I want versus what God wants for me. We're convinced of that. That's our sinful nature. We're also convinced that there is more joy in having what I see than having God himself. And we believe that there is more life off of the path than on the path. It's, it, it's important that you and I come to terms with the reality of that. Let's, let's look in the mirror for a moment and go, yeah, that's where I'm living. Yes, that is true of my heart. My heart desires to leave God's path. The psalmist feels this war in between what we know is good and delightful and gives life and what we crave. He wants the goodness of God's path, and so he's asking God to correct his course. But where do I go? Where do I go to get the course correction that I need? The psalmist knows it. God's word provides the life-giving correction that we need. This is the source of the correction that you and I need. So often, we're not even aware we're off course. We just kind of feel like things are not working out right. Like, that relationship's just falling apart, and, and I'm just angry, and I don't know why, and, and well, this isn't going, and that's not right. I just, I just feel things are not. We don't realize the reason is because we're off God's path, and we're trying to live off of his path and trying to make life work, and it's not working. It's just getting more and more broken by the way that I'm living. And he says this in verse 35, 36, and 37. Look at these three things he says. He says, Therefore, lead me, make me go, incline my heart, and turn my eyes. In other words, correct my course. I need you to show me where I'm off and get me back on. I'm not always going to see it. And even if I see it, I can't move by myself. I need your help. Put me back on. And, and where does he turn to get this course correction? He says, lead me in the path of your commandments, your word, your testimonies, his word, and your ways, which are found in his Word, this, gang, this is what we need. We're not going to see that we're off course. We're not going to see what the right course is until we look in here. It's not our best guess. It's not our wisest wisdom. It's what God tells us in his word that we desperately need, just like the psalmist says. God imparts life into you and into me through his word by showing us the correction that we need, where we're off and what it looks like when we're on his path. So the question is this, will you let him correct your course? Will you let him correct your course? Are you at a place where you want his path and you're struggling to walk on it? You want his path, but you don't even know how far off you are right now. Do you want his word to correct that? Will you beg him like the psalmist? Make me, yank me away from the mailboxes and the yards and get me back on your path. I need you to do this. Is that what you want? If that's what you want, his word is the tool he wants to use to help you see and understand so that he can help you move back to his path. I need this all the time. There's not a day that goes by where I feel like I am lined up perfectly on God's path. There's always something where he, he kind of just, he's so gentle and he's so loving. As I'm reading his word, he's like, hey, just want you to know that needs to slide over a little bit. Oh man, I didn't even know I was doing that. You're right. As I read his word, and some days, some days he knows I just need a nice upside the head. And so, uh, you know, it just, bam, okay, okay, yeah, wow, I'm way off on this. Thank you, Lord. And I'm grateful for it, but I don't typically see it until I go to his word. And the reality is this, I need it constantly. And if our hearts are constantly opposed to the way God wants it to be, and we're constantly leaving the path, we're prone to wander, our hearts are off course, how often do we need the word of God to correct it? Church, the answer is every single day. If we're going to follow Jesus, if that is your desire, 
If you want to walk on the path of delight and life, full of life that God has for you, you need correction, and so do I, every day. The longer we go without the correction, the farther off we go and the more destruction we are a part of by the way we're living. You and I need the life-giving direction and correction of God's word every day. Years ago, I wanted to remind myself of how, how significant that is and not to neglect the word of God, which it gets real easy in the busyness of life. Well, that can wait another day, whatever. So I, I put this on the front of my old study Bible. I'm gonna put that picture up. There it is. Uh, it says, there's my handwriting. I put it in text there for you. Keep shut to starve your soul and ruin your life. <laughs> oh, great, thanks. It, it, it was a stark reminder to me every time I saw that. Oh, wait, do I want to starve my soul? Not really. Do I want to ruin my life? No, let's take a look. I, it, it reminded me not to neglect it to make it a part of my life and get it built into a rhythm and a routine where God's truth could impart life to me every day so I can live in his joy and his peace and his life no matter what's going on in mine. What I found is this. And if you and I will take his word and we will give God our full undivided attention for a short amount of time every day, and if we will ask him to speak to us through his truth, to impart his life, to give us his direction, he will do it. He loves to do it. He's just waiting for you and I. Not to just respect his word, not even agree with whatever's in there, but to allow it every day to transform us by interacting with him in his word. This is, this is so, so important for you and I. The, we said this and looked at this survey that was done with so many people, 250,000 people um, back uh, about 15 years ago in the, in the first week of the series, that the number one thing that God uses to shape you to look and to live more like Jesus, that is to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, the number one thing he uses is to read and reflect on his word daily. This is the number one tool that he has. This is what he wants to use to change you. And if you're saying, I want to look and live more like Jesus, I want to be a follower, I want to be a disciple, here's the number one tool to read and reflect on it daily. What a gift that God has given to you and to me. Began this series six weeks ago with really one hope in mind. That you and I, by walking through these key ideas that are, are given to us in Psalm 119 about how God imparts life to us through his word would elevate for you and I the importance of this in our life. And that would translate into interacting with the word of God daily so that he could have his way in our lives. That was the hope. And, and so we looked at these things that, that there's blessing waiting, that there's truth and wisdom in God's word that can't be found anywhere else. That there is light that he wants to shine on our path so we can avoid unseen dangers. That there is comfort for our affliction that is powerful, hope-filled, real comfort for us. That we find out why we're living the way that we are and we don't understand. We find that here and that there is course correction to get us back on the path of life. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a powerful tool God has put in our hands. And our hope in looking at all that is that you would say, there are so many reasons for me to get into this. So many situations in my life where I need this. I might just need this every single day. And so the challenge that, that I issued the first week in this series is the same challenge as I've been praying about this that I want to give you again today. The challenge was this for one week straight to read and reflect on the word of God every single day. Not when you get around to it, but to make a plan every single day to get into the word of God. And so to that end, I wanna ask you, as I did the first week, do you have a plan? Because if you go to this tomorrow and you're like, hey, I'm gonna get in the word of God, but where do I start and how much should I read? And it's so big and that, you'll just put it back down and walk away. Whether it is digital, whether it is paper, you'll just walk away. 
So do you have a plan? And if you don't have a plan, I want to encourage you, go back and take a look at the message that we did the first week of this series. And, and you can skip to about the, the uh, two-thirds through the message or whatever, where we, st- we talk about this and, and give you some ways that you can get a plan. The second main component that we, we looked at in that first week was this. To help you do it, find a friend to read with was the challenge. And so many of you took that challenge and you gave me feedback on just what an incredible blessing that was for a week to be texting back and forth with somebody. Hey, here's what I read and here's a thought I got out of it. And they would do the same. And it was a real encouragement and and a step of growth for you. If you did it, I want to encourage you, do it again. It might be with the same person. It might be with a different person, but do it again this week. Text them today and say, hey, Would you be my Bible reading friend? And again, you can go back to the first message in the series and and get some more pointers on that. And if you didn't do it, I want to encourage you to try it. To find somebody just to text back and forth with, to encourage each other every day this week to be reading. The Bible is no ordinary book. The Bible is breathed out by God. It is his words to you and I, his words of life, living and active, that he wants to use in your life to impart life to you. May this week be a week of great interaction with the word of God and with God himself as you read and reflect on it daily, that this would become a center point in your life. Starting again tomorrow morning. You know, we're all in need of course correction. Every single one of us. The greatest course correction, the starting point for that is a relationship with God. We live in a very broken world. We see that everywhere. And we're surrounded by people that are broken all around us. We see that. And there's a brokenness within every single one of us. And it is all caused by sin. And that sin separates us from God. And there's nothing that we can do to fix it, to make it go away and and reconnect with God because our need for God is so great. We were made for him. We find our greatest joy, our greatest peace, our greatest life, our greatest love in a relationship with him. But it's broken because of sin. But God in his great mercy and his love for you wasn't okay with that, so he came here. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came here and he lived a perfect life and he gave himself willingly to be crucified on a cross. And on the cross, your sin and my sin was put on him and he died and paid for it so that whoever would put their trust in Jesus would be forgiven of their sin. The moment that you and I bow our knee and give our lives back to him and and give him the lordship, the, the kingship over our lives. My life is yours and I'm putting my trust in Jesus to pay for my sin and forgive me. In that moment, we enter into a reconciled relationship with the God of the universe that made us, that loves us, that has life full of life for us. And today, if you would say, I don't have that relationship with God. I've never put my faith in Jesus and given him my life. Today can be that day. In just a moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to pray and express your heart to God and receive that gift that he wants to give you of salvation, that forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with him now and forever. But if today you're saying, I have prayed that and I have given my life to Christ and I'm, I, I, I've bowed my knee to him and I'm, I'm struggling with following him, I need his help, but I've given my life to him and he's forgiven me of my sin. As we go to prayer in just a moment, we're gonna say thank you. Thank you for that gift. But I'm gonna invite you to pray for those who are wrestling with making that decision today. So if you would, everybody, if you would bow your head And let's pray together. And let's just start in your hearts right now. If you've given your life to Christ, would you just say thank you for the salvation that is mine today. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sin. Thank you for your love for me. And Lord, continue to lead me as I I look to your word every day this week. Lead me. Incline my heart. Turn my eyes. 
that I might live according to your path of life. And if you've given your life to Jesus, would you begin now just to pray for those who are making that decision today? And as you are praying, I just want to to encourage you, if you've not given your life to Christ and you're ready to bow your knee to him and give him your life and put your trust in Jesus to pay for your sin and enter in to the relationship with God you were made for, then I'm gonna pray a very simple prayer. I'm just gonna invite you to pray this prayer along with me in the quietness of your heart to express your heart to God. So if you would join me in this prayer. Dear God, I need a savior. I cannot save myself. I believe that Jesus lived, that he died, and he rose from the dead to be my savior. So right now, I choose to turn my life over to you, to let you be the rightful ruler of my life as you created things to be. And I put all of my trust in Jesus to forgive me of all my sin. Thank you for coming into my life now. Help me to live the rest of my life for you who gave your life for me. Thank you for saving me today. It's in your name, Jesus, that I trust and pray. And all God's people said, Amen. And would you welcome into the family of God those who gave their lives to Jesus today? Amen.